Hello, everybody. Welcome into the NBA front office show. As always, we've got a lot of news to get into today. We've got a big extension for Drew Holiday. We've got the Jonte Porter situation. Adam Silver talked a little bit about that. We've got some news on the Lakers draft pick this year, next year as well. Lots to talk about on today's show. Uh, Keith, let's just dive right in. I mean, the big news, big extension for, for Drew Holiday. I saw you already took to X a little bit to explain that even if the back end of this deal doesn't wind up looking so great, uh, it's okay because you're trying to go for it right now. And so this is what you have to do. What What are the terms on this deal? And I've yet to see, did anything come out about maybe, as I recall, it was $135 million over four years. Is there anything at the end of it to suggest maybe there's some non-guaranteed money or a team option or, or anything like that? It's actually a player option on the last year, but we don't Ooh. know about guarantees. Yeah, we haven't seen anything with that. So my guess is the Celtics uh, kind of, we've talked about this in the past. Sometimes when you want a guy to give up some money, and Drew Holiday was set to make a little over $39 million, uh, next season on his player option. Mm -hmm. He's lowering that number down to about $30 million. That $9 million is going to save the Celtics like $40 million in luxury taxes um, next season. So my guess is what this ultimately comes down to is, hey, if he's giving there, we're going to give on the end. We'll give the player option. I'm guessing with the idea of who cares four years from now, like it doesn't matter if he opts out. It's probably going to be close to retirement. If he opts in, we'll we'll handle it and deal with it. Uh, it's important for teams when they are up and over the second apron, if they mm -hmm. have depth, which Boston does, you can stack some contracts and ultimately only comes down to is ownership willing to pay what it's going to cost. And uh, Celtics ownership has said for really the better part of uh, almost two decades. Now we will pay if the team is a contender. And there were a lot of years where a lot of us were like, Hey, you're kind of a contender. Like, and you're still ducking the tax and doing all these things. Well, they're now it's like in for a penny in for a whole lot of pounds here. Cause they, they are paying you know a lot of money uh, to this team. And that that's kind of what you need to do when you're in mm -hmm. their spot. It's, it would not be uh, acceptable. I think to anybody to say, yeah, we, you know, we had to let Drew Holiday walk and weak in a team after especially everything they gave up to trade for him. So here we are, and they've, they've got just about everybody locked in for next season too. Uh, people immediately went to, well, I guess uh, Derek White's gone now. Derek White's under contract for next year. Well, this is kind of, I say it here all the time, when you're in this spot, let tomorrow's problems be tomorrow's problems. And you just load mm -hmm. up and go for it right now. Now, Drew Holiday will be 34 in June. Are you worried about the back end of this deal, especially now that it's a it's a player, which I'd be shocked if he didn't pick up that player option, given that he'll be, what, 37 years old when that option is, is in front of him. But are you worried about the back end of this? Not really. I, I mean, to an extent, but we're worried about that in four years, right? Like, sure. it's if this is what it takes to keep the team together when you're playing at this level, you – you do that. You you get it done and you keep the team together and you keep uh, trying to go out there and win. And Drew Holiday said his goal with Boston is he wants to win, try to win multiple championships. And that was part of why he extended. So I think it's, yeah, it's not going to probably look very good at the end. Very few of these contracts do when a player hits this age. But at that point, the Celtics can look at it and say, hey, now it becomes almost $40 million of, we can trade it and break them up into two, three contracts if we need to at that yeah. point. And that that that's also has value. So I, I think it's fine. And you, you figure it all out when you get there. All right. Uh, I agree. I think this is the kind of move that you need to make. You need to keep this team together for as long as you can. And if, look, if, if he falls off the next few years, then you deal with it when that time comes. But for right now, uh, you're keeping this group together. And then we'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Derek White into the future as well. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about because I, unless you had anything to close with, I don't, I don't think this is a bad deal. Like I think this makes a lot of sense. Is there any anything else we need to talk about here with with this contract? Because I, I want to be able to say, oh my gosh, this is terrible for the Celtics. How <laughs> this is awful, but it, it makes sense to me. And if it winds up being sure. a bad contract in a few years, then then so be it. A anything we need to close with here? Yeah, I mean, it's well under the max. Like, that's not that Drew Holiday's necessarily a max player, but this is this all goes back to we keep telling people you have to start 
and continue to reframe what a big contract is in yeah. the NBA now. And a $20 million contract is only slightly above the mid-level exception. Like that's where we're heading towards in the NBA. 25, that's you know higher. And then 30 is, that's kind of, 30 is going to be like the old 20 as far as, all right, 20 is not a max, but that's what you pay a pretty good player. We're all okay with that. That's where we're going with this. So I, I think it's one of those things where, like I said, it'll be tough. They're going to, if if they do extend Derek White, highly unlikely, even with the improved extension rules, I think Derek White is better served going into free agency and, and seeing what he can get, at least even if it's just from the Celtics as far as adding mm-hmm. more years and everything else onto his contract. But I think what we also want to be very cautious of uh, here is, everybody is kind of jumping to this whole idea of, well, you, you need to, now you need to let X player go and Y player has to leave and all these things. We can figure all that stuff out when you need to, you, you, you don't start bleeding talent until you need to in the NBA. And that's that we're kind of, we've talked about it with like the warriors. They're probably going to start bleeding a little bit of talent here, but they're also ba- barely in the playing tournament, right? They, they only clinched that like a week ago. So it's, it's completely different levels here. Sure. So I, I think it's just, it's, it's just a, th- this is the reality of when you're a second eight per team, you want to try to keep things together. And the best way you can keep things together is keeping your guys. And if ownership's willing to pay, they're willing to pay and you go from there. Now, if they fall apart and fall flat, let's say they get upset in the first round or something. I don't think you're going to see everybody just necessarily roll back. Not next season. I think they'll have to really have a good hard look at a lot of things to do with the team and figure it out. But if they're in the NBA Finals, then you you landed where you expect to land with a team like this. Keith, when you say don't bleed talent until you have to, that calls to mind the Oklahoma City Thunder and what they did with, with mm-hmm. James Harden way back in the day, making that trade that amounted to not much. I remember it was Kevin Martin and something Steven else Adams. was in that. Yeah, and so it, it didn't wind up uh, obviously giving them the return that you would think for a guy who really yeah. became James Harden when he went to Houston. He became the MVP, um, but still didn't get the return that they would have expected. And really, they made that move a year earlier at least than they needed to. And I think it came back to bite them. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you don't want to you don't want to try to make those moves any earlier than than you have to. Yeah, nobody, especially when they're to save ownership money, nobody wants to hear that, right? That's the last thing any fan wants to hear. I think even the ones who understand, hey, there's a limit to how much maybe they're going to pay. I think it's, again, let tomorrow's problems be tomorrow's problems. If nothing else for next year, this saved Boston a bunch of money. We'll see what it looks like two years from now. But for, for next year, the year after that, Things are things are probably just fine, and we'll we'll kind of keep keep it moving from there, and then then we'll we'll see where it goes. Is this ultimately? Do I think this Celtics team, as constituted, finishes the meeting the players finish their careers with Boston from Tatum to Brown to Holiday to White to Horford to Porzingis, all of them? No, I'm not. They've done this way too long. I just don't think there's any chance. I, I do think though. What this does is this keeps everything together and keeps them in uh, you know high, high, high end contender status, if not favorites. Obviously, they're the title favorites this year. Some can say it's Denver, but it's Boston by all the markets and everything. Sure. And they're probably going to be title favorites again next year, barring some you know major changes this offseason that we just haven't seen happen yet. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, let's get into this. Adam Silver talking about Jonte Porter. He had a, a press conference the other day and talked about this. Uh, this is the the quote here from Adam Silver when asked about this situation. He said, I have an enormous range of discipline available to me. It's a cardinal sin, what he's accused of in the NBA, and the ultimate extreme option I have is to ban him from the game. That's the level of authority I have here because there's nothing more serious, I think, around this league when it comes to gambling, betting on our games. And that is a direct player involvement. And so the investigation is ongoing. The consequence could be very severe. So, Keith, we've talked about this, that there's a decent chance if it turns out that Jonte Porter did 
for the purpose of making those unders hit on his player props, come out of games, declare himself in a, a, unavailable to play in games, pull himself from games, miss shots on purpose, any of those things, um, he's he's we're probably not going to see him in the N- NBA ever again. I think the NBA will use the full punitive measure that they have available here, not only to fit what happened or what may have happened. Again, they're still investigating, but also to make sure that it's clear moving forward what happens if you decide to do something like this. Yeah, this is the old, uh, you know, you'll appreciate this as a history teacher. This is the old, hey, stack up the corpses of the enemies so that the next people who come through see them. And they know, whoa, like, well, what is happening here? That's exactly right. what this will be. This will be hammer down on Jonte Border. It'll be one of two things. Either it will be a full lifetime ban or it will be a indefinite ban, which is, hey, maybe five years from now we can talk, but probably not. I think probably it's more likely to be the former where it's just a full lifetime ban and that'll be it. Now, let's be very clear. Nothing has been decided. Nothing is proven. None of that stuff. This was just Adam Silver basically saying, yeah, hey, there's an investigation. And I think this was also his opportunity, even if it comes out, hey, John T. Porter's clear of this. We couldn't prove anything. Or let's be very hopeful. We prove we we can prove he wasn't involved. Nothing happened here. And yes. that's the extremely rosy and optimistic view. Um, but this is Adam Silver's chance to kind of hey, I'm sending a message right now to anybody else who's maybe thinking about this. Don't, because yeah. well, th- that'll be it for you. And that, that'll be it. The other thing that'll be very hard too is um, it can be very difficult for these players to then get playing jobs professionally other places because FIBA um, requires what's called a letter of clearance, which is basically mm. any other outstanding obligations to another league or team. Uh, that the team is basically saying, yeah, they're free and clear of those for them to go play. Uh, they may say, no, that's it. And it'd be hard for you know a team overseas to say, all right, we'll overlook this because let's face it, the gambling stuff is everywhere. And it's going to be very hard to say, hey, we're bringing in Jonte Porter and go from here. So a lot, lot, lot of story yet to be written here, but Adam Silver certainly sending a message for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point about it, even if it turns out. And I hope that's the way it does turn out that yeah. he's not involved at all, and this is all Great. just, uh, and this all turns out to be nothing for him. That's that's the result I'm hoping for here. But you're right; he's using this opportunity of, hey, just in case, if it goes this way, this is what can happen. And so, letting everybody know, like, hey, you gotta you gotta make sure everything's on the up and up here. Um, yeah, without a doubt. A couple other things just yeah. from that. That was after the board of governors meeting that he spoke. Um, mm-hmm. Adam Silver talked about no set process for expansion, but he did outline, hey, still TV deals, but then we'll probably form an expansion committee. He said several cities um, and prospective buyers have reached out to the NBA to express interest. So the NBA is going to have no problem. Whatever they decide, we want one, two, four teams, whatever it is. They're going to have no problem finding a team, people that want to buy them, and they're going to really control that process. He also did say, yeah, the referees are calling games differently, that they all collectively agreed we need to do something here, and and games are being called differently. I think he said it amounts to about two fouls uh, per game that that were down. Now, those of us who watch Celtics Bucks would say, eh, two fouls, 22 fouls, eh, whatever. What's, what's, you know, what's a couple <laughs> dozen fouls between friends, Th- those but, refs had yeah. dinner reservations, Keith? They <laughs> yeah. couldn't be stopping the game a bunch, they had to get out of there. Hey, considering <laughs> right now covering Boston games for me is me looking up about every minute and a half or when the when somebody goes, <laughs> Oh, hey, because they don't mean anything, I don't care how quickly they play, play them very quickly and let's go so I can focus on other stuff. But yeah, it's a uh, clearly it, it's I'm fine with him saying, Yeah, hey, we wanted to address it because let's not let's let's be grown ups. We're not a bunch of dumb idiots that oh, I guess nothing did change and we're all stupid. Like, no, we all saw it move forward and go from there. So, Because that I, was the initial fine. reaction from the NBA was, <laughs> yeah. was, what? No, nothing. We haven't told the referees to change anything. Everything is just the same. You guys are crazy. And now they're kind of like, okay, yeah, it's we, we changed it. We changed it. And, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with them, with them changing it. The game's probably better this way. Yeah. But... 
Um, and not and not even probably it is better this way. Just I, I thought I just thought it was funny that they didn't just come out and say <laughs> I, they kind of hid behind semantics like, well, no, we didn't officially change the rules. We just changed yeah. how we're enforcing them. You know, I mean, it was goofy. Yeah. But now they at least have finally said, yeah, hey, we uh, we we made some we made some tweaks here, which is fine. A, a, a half dozen points of emphasis were uh, were made. Maybe, there you or, go. Or points of disemphasis, maybe. I guess is, <laughs> is a better way to put it on calling things. So yeah, it's a uh, yeah. And you're right. It's fine. It's 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 all been pretty good. So I'm I'm good with it, man. Um, yeah. Let's let's uh, hopefully now it's a non talking point and go. I will. I guess one last thing. I hope now we don't then kind of double down like normally in the playoffs. Where it's like we go back to like, oh, Kevin McHale clothesline Kurt Rambis into the <laughs> right. you know, eighth row under the basket. Just two shots. <laughs> two shots. Like yeah. move on. Like, like we don't need to go back to that. Um no, so let's I don't be, think you will. know, and I don't think we will. I, I think it's I think what we've seen over what the last month or so is mm -hmm. probably what we'll see in the playoffs. Uh, Keith, did you catch? Uh, I know Celtics games don't matter right now. Did you catch uh, Denver and Minnesota last night in a game that what a game. that really does yeah. matter? Uh, Bryce had a great write up on it over on Basketball Bullets, and I'll put the link in the description down below. Uh, boy, Denver, man, close games down the stretch. It doesn't seem to matter who the ball goes to. It, it's Michael Porter Jr. It's Christian Brown, whoever whoever it is that the defense leaves open because he can't take away everything. It's just like, oh, no problem. I'll knock down this shot. And that's that's yep. the brilliance of the Denver Nuggets right now. That Christian Brown dunk. Holy cow. That was one of the best. Uh, the, dunks, the go up uh, to get Gobert to commit with the right and switch it to the left. Oh, my yeah, God. That was unbelievable. Oh, nice. I said this, too, over on uh, Twitter. It is really incredible to me that the Nuggets seemingly hit a point in these games where it's like, all right, enough of this. Let's Let's put this thing away. And then yeah. they just dominate. I think they made from 10 minutes to play till two minutes to play. I think I have this right. They went 15 shots, 15 possessions in a row with a score. Um, Denver did. Like, I mean, this is against the league, one of the league's very best defenses. Like, now, and I, it's fair to note that, of course, the Wolves were without Carl Anthony Towns. Sure. So that gives you. You know, some hope that should these two sides meet up in the playoffs, then the, it will be, you know, perhaps a more interesting matchup. But yeah, it did seem like the Wolves have really got to fight. And this is most teams compared to Denver have really got to fight to find their scoring opportunities late and they're and they're they're have to put forth maximum effort in order to to get those looks. Denver, it just seems like they go, oh, OK, you're going to do that. Cool. I'm just going to go this, 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 this. And there's an open shot yep. for this guy. And no, it's not Jamal Murray. No, it's not Jokic. Doesn't matter. They're going to knock it down anyway. And oh, here is Jokic going to the basket and he's going to score this one. Oh, by the way. And then right when you start focusing on somebody else, Jamal Murray's going to drain a bucket for us. It's just, it's, it's so clinical the way they tear teams yeah. apart um, in, in crunch time. And that's, that's why I still think, I mean, as loaded as the West is, as deep as the West is, Denver is still has to be the favorite, I think, to come out. Yeah, I was asked today on a radio appearance, Denver or the field. And I said, normal years outside of when it was like, oh, it's Warriors Cavs. We all knew it in July that it was going to be Warriors sure. Cavs the next June. Um, I I will always take the field just because weird stuff can happen. But I'm Absolutely. that confident that I'm still going with Denver. And the biggest thing for me with them is, you cannot lose focus on defense for a second because yeah. not and, and everybody knows because Jokic will pick you apart. But in order for Jokic to pick you apart, his guys have to make smart cuts. They have to make the right reads to get into the right space. And they just do they They all know. And it's, it, it, it sounds silly, but it is very hard trip after trip after trip after trip to stay locked in on defense. For yeah. twenty, then they're pretty good, especially late in games, of bleeding that clock down till there is two seconds left, four seconds left. That's just it's hard for a defense to stay focused for that long. All five guys on a string. It's it's gonna be tough. I think the games Denver will lose in the playoffs will be teams outscore them. Teams come out, yes. just shoot the lights out, 
and Denver can't get enough stops because I don't know that in a low possession grinded out game, I don't know how many teams I would trust to, to beat the Nuggets. I, I just think it's there's very little you're going to throw at them that Jokic isn't going to figure out. Never mind game to game, like possession to possession. He sees yeah. it once or twice and he's like, all right, all right, I know what it is now. And then you see it in games and that's when like he gets it a step over half court, puts the ball on his hip. And then he just points to the other four guys. You hear, you hear, you hear. And then they, they go into something and it works because it's, I know it now. Now I know what you're doing. So it's, yeah, man, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome to watch like them go, go through the postseason this year. I can't wait. It's a great point. You know, in terms of tiers of NBA teams, I often look at it like this. You know, offenses are always trying to get defenses to make mistakes, trying to make defenses make decisions over and over and over again until they make a make a mistake, trying to make them make three, four different decisions on a possession. Um, but the worst teams in the NBA, when they do get a defense to make a mistake, they either don't recognize it, or if they do recognize it, they aren't able to capitalize on it, at least not yep. frequently. That's the that's the worst tier. The mid-tier of teams will often recognize the mistake, but can only sometimes capitalize on it. Um, the best teams, and this is what Denver is so great at because they're elite at this, they not only force the mistake, they recognize it and they capitalize on it almost every single time. Any type yeah. of little slip up, they make you pay for it. Oh, that guy's half a step off? Cool. The ball's going right here and you're getting burned because that guy was half a step off. It's uh, it's remarkable when you watch them down the stretch. And again, Bryce had a, a great write-up over at Basketball Bolts, and I'll put the uh, the link in the description uh, down below, that's our, our sub stack. But uh, I mean, just a just a good reminder of how clinical this Denver team is. And I think that's going to serve them very well in the postseason here. Yeah. And I loved Bryce's first call out. They went to AG at the five. They cut the yeah. rotation down. They played this like a playoff game because I think they knew this may very well be the game that decides home court advantage in the Western conference. And that's how they played it out. And, and you, you got to see like, man, when they cut down to their eight guys, there's just, there, there's nothing like there's, you can't find anything to, to, to attack there. There's just not, not that they're perfect because you can get stuff, but it's just yes. very hard. There's no one you can just help off of and say, all right, there's the guy. And almost every other team has somebody like that where you're like, Hey, if we have to live with something, we will live with this. You're just picking from living through a whole lot of terrible things to live through with the Nuggets if you're trying to decide, all right, we're going to give this up because that's what it is. I guess, if anything, it's we'll let Aaron Gordon shoot. But that's Aaron it. Gordon is so good about late cuts and late movement where it's like Nine right, the only thing Jokic, yeah, the only thing Jokic has left is to throw it to Gordon in the corner. Guess what? He's not there. He's at the rim. Like and that's that's just what where it becomes so tough. So yeah, it's it's really gonna be cool to watch other teams try to try to just knock them out of rhythm as best they can. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you're gonna see some team just try to get super physical and really try to bang them around. But good luck with that against Jokic. They're that's huge. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's gonna be like, great. You want to play like this? Let's go. There's not a player in the league out physicaling him. So I, I don't know. It's gonna gonna be really really tough to beat them. I thought it was really impressive. Again, I said nine assists for Aaron Gordon. You had four assists for Peyton Watson. There were, I don't recall if they were back-to-back -back plays, but they were within like a minute or so of each other. Aaron Gordon got into the paint. Like you could see, the Kings were doing everything, or the uh, the Wolves were doing everything they could to stop the guys that they were focused on stopping. That means giving guys like Aaron Gordon some open opportunities. He just goes, cool, cuts to the basket, forces the defense to commit and delivers a perfect drop-off pass for a dunk. And then the next time down, or or maybe it was it was right in the vicinity, Peyton Watson did the same. Like Peyton Watson is making high-level reads out there and attacking you and force and punishing you for paying more attention to the stars. Like, what what are you supposed to do with that? Right. I mean, that's that's gonna be really tough to deal with. But anyway, the nuggets are good. Hashtag analysis, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all right, let's get into uh, to this news. Uh, according to Kevin O'Connor of The Ringer, the Pelicans are widely expected to defer taking the Lakers pick. Instead of taking this year, they will instead get the Lakers pick, unprotected 2025 first-round pick. Keith, I think given the quality of this year's draft or how the perception of this year's draft is, this makes sense, not to mention the uncertainty around the Lakers. 
if I'm the Pelicans, I'd be doing the same thing. I, I would be saying, you know what? I could get a fairly decent pick maybe this year. We'll see exactly where it's going to land. But it's probably not going to get a whole lot worse, right? I mean, the West is crazy. It's going to get even deeper next year. Um, there's, I mean, maybe you drop down a few spots next year. But the upside, if you wait till next year, could be everything falls apart and you wind up with a really high pick. To me, this makes a lot of sense from the Pelicans' perspective to go ahead, wait one more year, and see what happens. Yeah, and so everybody knows the Pelicans don't need to make this decision till June 1st. Right. So that will be post-draft lottery, clearly post you know, uh, playoffs, play in tournament, not post playoffs, but post play in tournament season will be over. Mm -hmm. So they will know well in advance where the Lakers are picking. Uh, just for gamesmanship reason, I assume they'll probably delay it almost till the first, just yeah. because, right? But why not? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe if the Lakers get knocked out in the play in tournament, then the Lakers end up jumping up and having great lottery luck. They're one of the top two or three picks. Maybe the Pelicans say, all right, yeah, we do want it because we really like Zachary Sachet or we really like Alex Sar, or something like that, right? Maybe that's the direction they go. But if everything goes where we think it's probably going to go, the Lakers going to get into the playoffs. And then you're talking about a pick that's somewhere between 15 and like 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd probably you know, let it roll too. What's the downside? The Lakers have one of the four best, four or five best records in the league next year, and you're picking 25th? Like, all right, it's not the end of the world. To your point, the upside is, wait a minute, LeBron left, AD yeah. got injured or something, and now it's all gone to crap, and now they're, you know, oh, look, it was the Lakers who came up and get Cooper flag. But guess right. what? It's actually the Pelicans, right? And then then that turns into, oh no, you know, well, what what's happening here? So yeah, I, I think it's a smart move. There were this draft class didn't develop and evolve into the place where there's enough guys to feel like hey, we gotta have it this year. This is the year to to really feel like that. And the downside is so, in my opinion, so minimal that there's almost no reason not to defer it. So I, I think this makes sense. So let me ask you this then. What does this mean from the Lakers side of things? I mean, you've got Actually, potentially the salary of a, of, a, of a first round pick on the books, but we also knew that in their trade discussions this year that they're going to have over the summer, they would probably be including the 24 or 25 pick, whichever one they had. Does this change much for them? I think it's a good thing because it just gives you that clarity of we know this pick is available. And, and I don't know that it would so shock anybody if we are doing hat shenanigans at the draft where the Lakers make a pick knowing it's being traded to somebody else. Now it's a little harder for them only because in order to make really meaningful trades, D'Lo probably seems like the most likely guy just to be involved, just, just from a sense of where we've all been expecting this to go. That may involve the need to do a sign and trade or something like mm -hmm. that. That can't be done at the draft, obviously. So that that complicates things to some extent. But the Lakers will go into that pick knowing, hey, team X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one, two, three. Those teams are interested in player, yo, X. We'll take him because we're okay if we get him and keep him. But we're more interested in having that guy and, and maybe you know turning it into a trade piece later. Uh, down the line. So it's, it's, I, I just think the clarity for the Lakers is better than the whole, all right, well, now we get to wait a whole other year. And, and it just, it just cleans things up considerably for them moving forward with now we can trade this pick. We can do this. We're not in a spot where who knows a year or two from now, we could be in a spot where they're dealing with second apron issues. And then it becomes, mm -hmm. All right, well, the pick's now bumped to the back of the round and all that sort of stuff that's coming in with those issues. So at least if you get a pick to trade right now, you know, hey, it's maybe not the greatest pick in the world, but it's still a mid-first round pick. And and here, here you go. That in, in them, obviously, well, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter because postseason, uh, outside of playing tournament, the results don't, don't matter. They're going to be somewhere in like the 15-18 range if they get in the yeah. playoffs. So there it is. Yeah, I I think it's a good thing for them ultimately. 
And this is, you know, we could very well wind up in a situation where, because the Lakers actually have to make the pick because the mm -hmm. 2025 pick would be gone in this scenario Correct. where we get the the wrong hat on draft night where yeah. The, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll yep. get that, that potential weirdness where everybody knows that they made a trade, but that player, whoever it is, has to get up and put on the Lakers hat and everything, even though everybody knows that they're actually going to, I don't know, wherever. Yeah, and then and you're gonna get something like yo, uh, I don't know, Lake, Laker fan one two five eight seven on Twitter is like, oh man, I didn't I didn't want this guy. Why are you drafting another guy? Because he hasn't been paying attention all day, right? And he's gonna be screaming and yelling. Or people are gonna get super excited about, oh man, we landed you know this player who's you know he, he fell in the draft, and I'm excited. It's gonna be like, yeah, he ain't staying. Yeah, like no, like that's you know <laughs> that's the that that's part of the silliness of, of draft night and all that mm -hmm. all right uh Giannis Antetokounmpo after getting an MRI on his calf he is out for the remainder of the regular season is he back for the playoffs because if not that could get kind of messy yeah we're on Giannis watch here because we're nine or ten days uh from from the I'm gonna assume Right, that they they finished in the two seed, so we, uh -huh. we that they, they did mean... they got the win over the Magic, which Correct. it was yep. was actually pretty Big important one. for them. Yep, yeah. After beating Boston the other night, now now they beat the Magic, so yeah. So I, I think they're gonna probably stick in the two. We'll see. Maybe the Knicks can figure it out and go from there. But I think with the uh, with, with the the Bucks, um, we're nine, 10 days from Giannis needing to be ready. It's going to be the 20th or 21st that he's going to have to be ready to play. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we have been given no indication of what level of calf strain this is uh, beyond the Bucks saying he's not going to play. He's going to receive treatment for the rest of the regular season. That's where we'll go. So it's at my guess is we're going to get the Giannis Antetokounmpo questionable for game one, whoever they're playing. And that'll mm -hmm. probably go almost right down to, to, to tip game off and it'll be, he's going to test it out or maybe it'll be, Hey, he's not going. And we all know this and he'll get ruled out because the bucks were reasonable about that last year with his back injury. They didn't necessarily play a bunch of injury reporting games. If I remember that correctly. So we'll, we'll see, but yeah, that's, that's where we're at now because it's definitely not playing in the next two. All right. So Dennis Schroeder to move on to the nets, Dennis Schroeder hopes to stay with the nets. And Ben Simmons, the Nets are not expected to buy him out. Now, both of these guys are on expiring deals. Now, mm -hmm. it's interesting, though, this is news that Dennis Schroeder wants to stay with the Nets. Yeah, you're under contract with the Nets for next season. You know, that, that's the type of report you typically hear from a player who is a free agent. Like, oh, I'd like yeah. to stick around and stay. Obviously, though, we know the Nets are going to be active on the trade market. They've got these expiring contracts that they can package together now in both Ben Simmons and Dennis Schroeder. So that's why this is becoming a thing, but just kind of interesting that this is already popping up like, Hey, how many expirings could Brooklyn package together and try to make something happen? Um, I think we're going to be in for a pretty nets heavy news summertime period. I, I guess so that's an extremely awkward way of saying it. I think there's going to be a lot of nets trade rumors for us to handle this summer. Yeah, I'm with you. I, and it's exactly what you laid out. They've got a lot of tradable salary that, that they can move. They, they don't have a lot of draft picks, so that's going to make things a little bit more difficult on that front. So, uh, but yeah, in, in the Dennis Schroeder stuff, to be uh, fair to him, it's not like he said, "Hey, everybody, come over here and listen to me. Let me tell you about yeah. how you know I, I, I want to stay here." It was he was asked, "Like, hey, do you hope to be back here next year?" And and quite frankly, I can't really blame Dennis Schroeder. Like, he's played for a bunch of different teams in the yeah. last few years, so I, I'm sure he is like. No, yeah, I'd kind of like to stay somewhere. He talked about how much the uh, the organization, how great the organization has been to him and his family and all that stuff. Now, the Ben Simmons stuff is the Nets are not expected to look at a buyout. They're planning on Ben Simmons being a part of the team. He uh, uh, In the same um, news article as Brian Lewis of the New York Post, I believe it was, maybe the Daily, mm -hmm. I think it was the Post. I'm 99% sure it was the Post. He said... Um, Ben Simmons is uh, had successful surgery, and the Nets are expecting he can uh, do normal summer workouts and play pickup and all that stuff. Sure, we're all we're all at the point where I'll believe it when I see it. But mm -hmm. if nothing else, he's forty point three million in expiring salary, which 
the Nets are not in a place to have cap space. So it does them no good to buy him out unless he's like, okay, give me $1 million and I'll give back $39 million, which yeah. he's very clearly not going to do. Maybe it might be the other way. I'll give you back a million and I'll keep 39, but 40.3 million in expiring salary. That's, that's a, it's a pretty good place to start. And the piece does know, which of course they did that just about matches with uh, Donovan Mitchell's salary in Cleveland. If, if, for, if that matters for any reason to, to anybody. Now I'll, I'll say this. It doesn't, I don't think there's any trade interest in Ben Simmons. But even if there was any shred, any belief that maybe somehow, some way, some team might have a little bit of interest, even if the Nets, the Net, and I'm not saying they do think this, even if the Nets right now said, no matter what, we cannot bring this guy back next season. I don't care what we have to do. This guy cannot be on the roster next season. They should be shouting from the mountaintops. There's no way in hell we're buying him out. It's not happening. We're not going to buy him out. Never, never, never. That way, teams will trade, right? I mean, yeah. way, if you are, and again, I don't think anybody's interested in Ben Simmons, but it does not help the Nets position at all if they make it known that, oh yeah, we're going to buy this guy out because then teams will say, well, you know what? If we wanted to give a look to Ben Simmons, we're just going to wait till you buy him out and then pick him up for nothing. Why sure. don't we do that yeah. rather than have to part with assets and go through a trade and all that kind of stuff? So again, not saying that's what's what's, I'm expecting to happen or anything like that, but it makes no strategic sense for the Nets to allow anyone to think that they might actually buy out Ben Simmons. And again, I don't, I think they're being on the up and up in this. I don't think they're going to, but just from a street, street, a strategic standpoint, any team in the NBA right now in any kind of similar situation at all should be screaming to anyone who will listen to them that they're not buying the player out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's just no benefit to it. And, and again, you don't do a buyout in the off season unless you need to create wiggle room to do something else. That mm -hmm. is the only reason to do a buyout in the off season. Otherwise, you sometimes you'll straight wave a guy and just eat the contract. Otherwise, you keep the contract, you let it sit on your books until you've exhausted all trade opportunities. Because I know it sounds callous and rude, but he's Ben Simmons expiring contract. Like that's what he is right now till yeah. he can show he can play more than a handful of games and be a productive player. All he is, is a $40.3 million living, breathing trade exception. That that's, that's how you have to think of this. And it's actually a little better than that. Cause you can add other stuff to it if you're going to trade him. So that's yeah, there, there you, you definitely do not need to be talking about any kind of buyout stuff with him. No, definitely. All right, um, let's get into uh, this. Tim Connolly does have an opt-out with the Wolves, which, Keith, given the Wolves' success, does he opt out and then get another deal? I know we don't talk about opt-outs with, with front office personnel very often, but what does this mean for Minnesota, particularly now that Minnesota's not for sale, maybe, <laughs> I guess? That's <laughs> the key. Well, as the world yeah. turns with all that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll see down the line if we need to create a new uh, drop for, uh, for Wolves drama. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out if we need to. Um, it is, that's the key part though. It's all that drama. Tim Connolly built the foundation of the Nuggets title team. He's built the Wolves up into being a very, very good team. They're if anybody's looking for another GM and there are going to be other teams, we, we know that there's going to be probably a couple teams that make some moves here. If Tim Connolly says, you know what? I just don't want to deal with this. Like there's too much drama here and I'm already here and I'm going to have to cut payroll, you know, and do all these other things and all that stuff. Maybe he does come back around and say, I'm out. I'll go take on another team and build them up instead. Cause I don't want to deal with all the, uh, madness that's going on here. So that's why it was noted. This came from Shams uh, today. That's why this was, was noted, I think was because of the drama that's going on. So one more thing to watch. And it's, it, this all sucks. Cause this should be, we should get, be getting ready to celebrate and talk about the wolves as coming off one of the best seasons in franchise history in the regular yeah. season. And this team has a real chance to do, do some damage in the playoffs and maybe make a run. Maybe they can push Denver, you know, who knows? And instead it's, 
are they going to, what's going on with the sale? Is their GM leaving? Are they going to have to cut payroll? Like, where are we going with this? It's like, we're talking about all this negative stuff when we should be celebrating what a great season they've had. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's unfortunate, definitely from the Wolves side of things, but I'm feeling if they start making some noise in the playoffs, the attention is going to focus primarily on that stuff. I but, hope. uh, yeah, but still, yeah, not, not ideal. And, um, do you see the rumor that the sale, like the, the reason why, uh, they took steps to undo the sale or not, not go through with it was there was a, a salary projection that came in from the potential buyers yeah. from, uh, from Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez that showed them ducking the luxury tax. And yeah. they were, there was concern that we're not going to be able to sustain success. And that was now again, keep in mind, there's information that's going to come out is going to be selective and it's going to yeah. be put out for specific reasons. And, you know, you're playing with public opinion and all that. But I did think that was interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, uh, Glenn Taylor and Camp White Knight a little Taylor, bit yeah. here. Of, Look at us. We saved you guys from having to trade Carl, Carl Anthony Towns or having to get rid of Mike Conley or, you know, whatever it is. Like, okay, you know, let's, I'll believe it when I see it because I, you know, this team better, they better make a real run in the playoffs. Otherwise, there's going to be conversations had about how expensive they are. It's just, sure. they've never been anywhere close to this expensive. And it's, it's, you know, a whole, Whole uh, new, new, new world there. I, if anybody's interested, you can find it on my Twitter timeline. I wrote about it extensively on Real GM uh, at the end of February. All right, not Real All right. GM. I don't know where that came from. Boy, I stepped back like a decade. I was, I was like, are you writing about this on, on Real GM yeah. message boards, yeah. Keith? I, I just oh, went man. with it. I'm I would have. <laughs> yeah, a decade plus <laughs> ago. Yeah, I probably would have written a very long uh, article length uh, message board post because that's what I did for a long time. But yeah. Um, where where is the article? <laughs> it's on Spot Track. It's on Spot Track. Okay, <laughs> yeah. just making sure. It's on Spot Track. <laughs> yep, <laughs> where where ninety nine percent of the things I write are <laughs> that that's where it is. I knew it was either. I'm I'm like I'm going to feel real bad that somehow I missed it on the basketball <laughs> bulletin, and you're going to tell me that's where it is. <laughs> yeah, or right. <laughs> or it's going to be on Spot Track. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Trevor, full disclosure, I'm tired. Like, I, I, and I <laughs> and I'm needing to. I need to get ready for the playoffs. <laughs> like I need to be able to stay up till one in the morning to watch the playoff games. Cause we know a lot of them here in the East coast, they won't tip off till 10 or 10 30. And man, I, the last two nights I've been up to like two in the morning and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here. <laughs> you got to build up that, uh, that resistance. Oh, you got to be ready. You got to be ready for, yeah. for postseason basketball. Yeah. It's coming. I might, might have to start chugging an afternoon coffee. My might be in my future. We'll see. There you go. Uh, last thing we've got, Jalen Johnson is going to be out for three weeks. That, I mean, depending on what happens with the Hawks, that could be the end of his season. Um, yeah. That'll be determined by what happens in uh, the play-in tournament. Yeah. They're, and they're just to do a refresher for those who may not know, they're locked in. Uh, it's the only thing to be decided between them and the Bulls is who hosts. Uh, yeah. the play in tournament that they're the, the nine ten game rather uh there. So yeah, the Hawks would need to win that, win another one, and then maybe he gets back by the end of the first round, but probably not. You're hey, yeah. this is uh hey, I don't want to be rude to Hawks fans, but this might as well say Jalen Johnson's season is over. So I'm glad you yeah. pulled this up. So what we know in the East, Bulls Hawks in the play in, Celtics are the one seed. That's it. Nothing else has been Term. We know the Bucks and Knicks have top six seeds, so mm -hmm. uh, there we did get a little clarity in the West, though. Uh, Clippers and Mavs are going to play down here. in the first round. We do know that now. So who will is host? it? Is it locked in? Who's I forget who has the tiebreaker. Do you know? Is it locked in? Who's hosting? No, it's not locked in. No, because because uh, they can still Mavs can still finish ahead of them because they could True. finish fifty two and thirty. So yeah, so it's still still a little bit to be decided there. I thought the Clippers were going to pull off one of the seasons like more unbelievable wins. Took yeah. the Suns a long time Bones to win last night. Yeah, Bones Island. If Bones Island hadn't cramped up and had to come out of the game in the fourth quarter, who knows? So so we're there, and then uh, and then we now have clarity that the uh, Lakers and Warriors will be in the playing tournament. They can't uh, get out of that. So where? Yeah, this this is a cool graphic. I this was so really this was so well done by the NBA to yeah. provide this that shows what where what is still possible for teams to yep. finish, and you can see uh, what possible spots teams can teams can be. Um, it's it's crazy how many now when you look at some of these, we know some of these are not really going to happen. 
but like the Lakers path to the seven seed is almost impossible, right? Like it's just yes, extremely unrealistic, but this is, this is mathematically what in theory could still happen. All the different options, the Pacers, good Lord, they could be anywhere three to eight. Like, my God, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is. It, it is. Um, it, it's, it's nuts how, you know, much can still change here. And we've still got some big games to, to come. There's a lot of these teams are playing each other. Pelicans and Kings are playing tonight. That's a yep, huge that's a game one. tonight. So guess what? I'll be up late again. Um, so yeah, but I'm that man. This is, this is awesome. This is uh one of the best finishes to a regular season we've had in a very long time. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe down to remember it was, um, gosh, I can't remember. Was it Timberwolves and Pelicans played in a game? No, it was Timberwolves and Nuggets, I believe it was. They played on the last day of the season. It was winner gets in as the eight seed, loser is out. And oh, I think yeah. hearing people talk about it, that was the, they they did the playing tournament out of necessity in the bubble, but that was a piece of um, a thought to the NBA. Hey, we might be onto something here. Right. Having this this sort sort of situation, it brings in so much attention. There's, it's almost a little March Madness esque. Like you lose, you're out, and that just brings in so many eyeballs because there's so much on the line. So, um, certainly exciting the way that we're seeing this, the way that uh, th- this is looking like it's going to wrap up here uh, this season. I mean, so much is still up in the air. You look at that. The Pelicans can be anywhere six through ten. The Pacers can be anywhere three through eight. You've got four landing spots potentially for the Heat, four for the 76ers. Uh, a lot is still undecided. You were starting every day. We're getting a better sense of, okay, what is likely to happen here and what is unlikely to happen. So this, I think, makes it look like there is more possibilities than than they're realistically. Like we know, you know, like if you're playing the Blazers, you're, you're probably not losing that game, right? So sure. yeah. it's... You know, so that there's situations like that that would eliminate some of these possibilities, but still, um, or, or like the Jazz have lost 13 in a row. If you've got the Jazz on your schedule, all right, you probably feel pretty good. You're, you're going to win yeah. that game, but uh, but, but still, a lot stumble. undecided. Every once What's in a that? while, right? Team teams do stumble sure. and stub uh-huh. their toe against a bad team, and then they they kind of then are left to rue it for the rest of the uh, the off season. So yeah, I I can't wait. It's going to be such a fun um you know last uh. A week or so, or week weekend, I guess, uh, of basketball. So that'll, that'll be great. Let me ask you this before we get out of here: Do you think home court determines the outcome of Clippers Mavs? Uh, no. I think health. Okay, health is what really matters there. Good point. Yeah, Kawhi is how injured is Kawhi really? Yep, Kawhi right. is full go. That's that's a toss up to me. Either team can win a game seven on the road. I'm not worried mm-hmm. about that. If Kawhi's limited or Kawhi can't go, I think the Mavs are gonna gonna cruise. I think they'll yeah. beat them in maybe maybe six, but probably five. Yeah. All right. We're in agreement there. As usual, as usual, <laughs> we're in agreement. Everybody, we want to thank you guys for joining the show today. Make sure you do subscribe to the NBA front office show on YouTube. Don't forget. Uh, the podcast feed as well over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're going to, of course, keep you up to date on all the news, the playoffs, everything that's happening, all the different permutations and things for the standings and and all of that, as well as the biggest news stories of the day for the NBA. And, of course, you guys know our time to shine this offseason. We get into all the contracts, all the trades, all that kind of stuff with free agency, the draft as well, certainly. But, again, everybody, thank you. Till next time, we'll see you and stay safe.